Surfer's Edge was based on an actual murder case that took place in California in a town near San Jose called Milpitas, where a high school kid had uh, strangled his girlfriend, uh, brought her body to the woods, and then gone back and told his friends about it and brought all his friends to see the body over a period of several days. Do you see this? <laughs> yeah, I see it. <laughs> Why did you kill her? She was talking shit. The, the, the murder was covered by American newspapers. It got fairly wide coverage from Associated Press. And also there was an article in Rolling Stone that was pretty well known that detailed the case. And that's what the writer of the screenplay, Neil Jimenez, had read uh, when he started the script. And he took the newspaper accounts, and I think the Rolling Stone account, filtered that through his own high school experience in Sacramento, California. You know, it was a, a well-written uh, screenplay that, you know, you can say topically what it's about, that, that it was based on, I think pretty loosely based on a, uh, an actual uh, incident that, that took place. But it caught some, something about the way people spoke and probably still speak, but uh, there was something about the sound of the, the language that uh, immediately sounded familiar in some way. It's like some fucking movie, you know? Friends in second grade fucking like this. And then one of us gets himself in potentially big trouble. And now we've got to deal with it. We've got to test our loyalty against all odds. It's kind of exciting. I feel like Chuck Norris, you know? <laughs> There's definitely something caught in it that is uh, unusual. <laughs> and then I don't know quite how he got it to, it to the attention of, uh, but he did get it to the attention of the producers, Midge Sanford and Sarah Pillsbury, who had done a film, uh, Desperately Seeking Susan. What I gather is that they spent a fair amount of time shopping the screenplay to studios, trying to make it at a low studio budget of about $5 million. And nobody would touch it. It was way too dark. The script just totally blew me away. So I, uh, I called them up and said, I have to do this picture. And they said, well, nobody will touch it. We don't think that we can get it financed. And I got on my high horse and announced, I said, I, I'll make it for a million dollars. And at that point, they sort of did a double take. And uh, we took it around again at a much lower price tag. And it, it, instantly then there was some, some interest in it from the, from the, uh, the independent companies. It was a very tough film to cast, and it was really the most memorable casting experience of my career. We just set about to bring in as many young actors as, uh, as possible. It was not too long after Back to the Future had come out, and uh, I'd, at that point, after that film had come out, I'd kind of, uh, and that it had made a lot of money, I felt a certain obligation to finding so something that somehow psychologically reflected what my own interests were. Crispin Glover had seen the script and had expressed interest in doing it quite early on. And he had been in Back to the Future, of course, so we thought, well, Crispin might be a good bet for us, we can, he's somewhat well known and we can anchor the rest of the cast around him. I, I, knew, I knew that there was interest in me for the film and so I, uh, and I knew that it had something to do with the murder. So I kind of immediately thought, oh, well the murderer would be an interesting person to play. But Crispin refused to come in and audition for it for a number of weeks. It's not that he wouldn't come in, he just wouldn't come in for a few weeks because he said he had to work on his interpretation of the part. So there was a there was a, several weeks in the casting process where we thought that we might want to cast Crispin Glover. We wanted to cast Crispin Glover, but we didn't really know much about 
Crispin Glover. Sometimes when I first read a script, I'll just look at the character that I'm interested in or it wasn't with the, the character that I'd been told that there was interest, but I thought, well, that's the character I should look at. So I looked at it just for that character at first, which is the, not the character I play in the film. Uh, it's a character called Samson. Uh, but there was, uh, the way I looked at it when I read it, it seemed uh, like that character was, uh, there was an insecurity or something. It's not necessarily the way that uh, it, it was played in the film, but there was something about it that I didn't think would be right for me to play. And finally, a few weeks later, Crispin came in to read for it. And he came in, in his wardrobe, with the wig, with the black hat, totally in character. I'm serious, Tim. I essentially went in for, uh, in the, essentially played it the way that I play it in the film. And the producers and I, you know, were sort of stunned by the audition and we just kind of looked around and did a double take and then we we went through a process where we had to decide whether this fairly radical interpretation of the character would work for the film and what it would do to the balance of the film if we cast him. Tim had me do it again where he said don't just don't do anything because I was I was doing this kind of like I'm talking about heightened reality, um, and I knew what he I knew what he meant. Where he didn't he didn't want me to do that kind of thing. There's a more uh, there's not really a, a technical word for it, but I'll call it naturalism. Underplaying something. Then I got uh, the offer for the part. Tim had watched the the audition back uh, with both of the ways that I played it. And he said he liked the way that I originally came in uh, with it. Uh, and so we agreed to, <laughs> to do it that way. I feel real twisted right now. Twisted like I should just go to the cops and tell them where John is. I wouldn't even joke about that, Clarissa. What would you do, kill me? You'd love that, I bet. You and John could run off and be outlaws together. But first, to show off to your friends, strap my dead body to the top of this car and drive all over town. Get out. What? You don't understand a goddamn thing, do you? Jamie is dead, damn it. And there's nothing that we can do to save her. Now I happen to like Jamie. But John is still alive. Don't you see that? I do remember after the first take, Tim came up and said, are you, are you sure that we should maybe do it in this other way? I said, no, no, we talked, we talked about it. We agreed. And, and uh, so then the, so then the, you know, I stuck with uh, uh, playing it in heightened reality. The thing that was most interesting to me is, is that whereas on the page in the, in the in the script, Crispin's character Lane, who was the charismatic leader of this group of kids, ostensibly might have been f s sort of functioned as the moral center of the film, even though it was a false moral center. He wants to save his friend from the police. There's a way of playing that intention that would be, like I say, what is on the written on the page. There. Because, again, I, the way I was uh, trained with acting and the, I had thought a lot about intentions, I also saw there was another way of playing the intention. Okay, listen up. Got a lot of people here. Can bury her so she's never found. Is anybody going to help me? His interpretation of it was so radical that that no longer was the case. And Dennis Hopper's character, as perverted as the guy was, really becomes the moral compass of the film in an odd, in an odd kind of way. Company. Yeah, I love company. Cast and Crispin changed the, the balance of the film, but uh, obviously works. It seemed like it made sense for this character to be on that 
kind of extreme uh, uh, adrenaline that a heightened uh, need for getting these things uh, was appropriate. Then we worked hard to cast Roxana Zal as Ioni Sky's best friend. Roxana was pretty well known from a couple of TV movies, a thing called Something About Amelia. So the parts slowly came together with their actors, Dan Roebuck as Samson. The hardest parts to cast were Matt and Clarissa, and then Matt's little brother, Timmy. So we saw a lot of people, and then Carrie found out about Keanu Reeves, who was a young actor who had done a couple of supporting parts in uh, sports pictures in Canada, and he was down with a new agent. He was at ICM making the rounds, and uh, he came in, and it seemed pretty clear to us that this was a movie star in the making, so we cast him. The hardest part of the main characters to cast was uh, Clarissa, and we looked at tons of young actresses. None of them seemed to have it quite right. And then um, in, I opened up a, a copy of the LA Weekly, which is the local free paper in town, and saw a picture of Ioni Sky in a small fashion spread, in this uh, sort of hippie fashion spread in this free LA paper. And I just said, she looks interesting. Let's see if we can find her and bring her in. We brought her in. She'd never done anything, but we worked with her and uh, tested her on tape with Keanu and just went with it. We had actually cast another actor for, uh, for Timmy, we cast Corey Haim, who was a relatively well-known uh, kid star at the time. And he showed up for the first uh, day of shooting, and he was sick. Basically, he had something akin to pneumonia. And uh, he also wasn't very focused on the, on the part. So he basically had to drop out for health reasons and we had seen at the very last minute, too late to cast him, but we had seen Josh Miller, who had come in really after the part was already cast and auditioned for it in this really creepy, interesting, androgynous sort of way. So when Corey was unable to proceed with the film, we grabbed Josh and put him in at the film. It already started when we, uh, when we cast uh, Josh Miller. So it was a long, difficult, odd casting period, but I guess it worked out. People knew that it was a good, good screenplay and people were excited to be working on it. And there is something about when you're early in, in your career, there's a certain kind of excitement about being in a new kind of thing and trying to get something across. and. And many years later, you know, after having been in a num quite a number of films, there is a different energy about how one approaches things, and uh, uh, you can argue that it's better or worse. I, I'm not sure which. The wonderful thing about working with young actors is that they're they're all feeling and no bad habits. So my approach to it is is just to help them stay with the heart of the scene, the heart of the moment, uh, and to find the, the, the passion and the commitment in those scenes and just to make sure that the performances don't get uh, diluted. Going to facts, huh? What do you know about facts? That was the whole other separate track of, of casting the film, was looking for somebody to play feck. And we looked at a, a lot of people, but the problem there was that because the budget of the film was so low and, and we were basically paying everybody scale, Hemdale understandably wanted to pay scale for that actor also. Text in the mail! No time for bullshit! Back, open up! Yeah, and put that thing away. Last thing we need is cops. Hurry your ass! You met John. Hey, I killed men bigger than you! Lithgow wouldn't do it. Harry Dean Stanton wouldn't go near it. and. Uh, Dennis was uh, out there as a, as a possibility, and I was a little worried that Dennis had done this kind of part maybe a, a couple of times before, and that it wouldn't be that 
fresh, but I was, I was totally wrong. I killed a girl once, it was no accident. Put the gun right to the back of her head, blew her brains right out the front. I was in love. At a, at a certain point, we, we really very badly wanted Dennis to do it, and we wanted Hemdale to, uh, to uh, offer him some, some dough so that he would do it. And we were trying to figure out how we could get some leverage to get Hemdale off the dime. And uh, I started auditioning an actor named Timothy Carey, but he was a, 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 a well-known, brilliant, but unbelievably difficult actor who would never stick to the script and you never knew what he was going to do. He was completely willful and totally unpredictable. And when he, Tim, Tim Carey did come in and audition for it, and he refused to stick to the script. He constantly ad-libbed lines about farting, which tended to be his thing, and uh, not physically, but in dialogue. And, uh, and so, so, so basically, by threatening Hemdale with casting Timothy Carey, they finally got off the dime, and we were able to, to cast Dennis Hopper. This, this story, if does not, I think, besmirch the memory of Tim Carey, who was brilliant in a number of, uh, of movies, but everybody was quite scared of him at that point in, uh, in time because he was just so un un unpredictable. Very quick after that, I think that uh, from the point that I first read it, we were in pre-production in less than four months. The picture was in front of the cameras just a few months after the whole thing started, and we wound up, uh, wound up costing a million seven, I believe. I think uh, fondly of, of the film and all the people in it, because it, it, it is a good experience, and, uh, and it is a good film. It was a well-written screenplay, and then it was well-realized by Tim Hunter. It got good people involved, uh, shot well by, by Fred Elms. Well, I was excited about that when I was 16. I went and would go and see Racerhead over and over again, so I was familiar with his work. And um, well scored by Jürgen Neiper. And yeah, it was just all, all, when, all around well done. Some of my favorite scenes in River's Edge have to do with the conversions of the action in the scene and the music by uh, Jürgen Knieper. He's still killing her. I just loved the score. He had done films for Vim Vendors, and I hired him. And uh, I thought he did a great score. So the scene where Timmy uh, desecrates his sister's doll grave, and Keanu runs after him and catches up with him and almost beats him up. And I asked Jurgen just to really make the music big, and which he did. And so that's a favorite of mine. Answer me! I didn't do anything. Fuck you! Answer me why! Why? Hey, get off of her, come on! You dirty traitor! What do you mean by that? You know what I mean. I saw you on the phone tonight. You keep your little mouth shut. You're gonna pay for what you did. You're gonna die for what you did. You little shit! Hey! You're gonna take me! I, I know I was deliberately looking for a more timeless setting for the film. And we shot it in uh, the foothills north of Burbank in a town called Tahunga, which had a number of river rock houses, rock houses and, and fences, some of which are in the are in the film. It had been a community that had been settled in the 20s as a tuberculosis uh, uh, as, as an area where people could go and, and, and take the cure for tuberculosis. By the time we got there, it was a smog pit, but, uh, but the, the, the houses were dense with vegetation and had that old river rock feeling to it, and there was a park. The scene where the girls are on the phone is in a park in the middle of town. And so I kept it away from that kind of tract house suburbia that had become popular in movies at that point as a, as a symbol of its own. And, and I think that that probably was a good decision because I always thought of Tahunga as the land that time forgot. Well, it was generally well received, but it had a mixed reception because it was, it was too tough for, uh, 
for some for some critics and some uh, audiences. It was panned in uh, Variety, for example. I had had a fairly decent reputation from Tex, and I think Variety said, "Why would Tim Hunter want to get involved with a piece of tawdry little baggage like this, or something like that?" And uh, and uh, you know, so it was dismissed by some people. But it, but it it uh, it got a it, it got good reviews when it came out. It had a generally good reception. It had played at Telluride, played at Sundance. Uh, Island Pictures bought it for distribution at Sundance. So it had its uh, reputation. I remember when I got a hold of the script thinking that this was something that might shake people up and that uh, it wouldn't be a film that, that uh, would be greeted with the complacency that so many of the movies of the period were were greeted with. And I'm an old anarchist, and uh, I saw, and Crispin Glover also, especially, I think, saw the black humor elements in the script. And those were disturbing because you're adding a, a very nihilistic, comedic element to a very serious subject that people tend to take reverentially, if not, and, and certainly seriously. I, I've been making my own films that I tour around with. And uh, I talk about this film at the, the, the shows because something that I feel quite impassioned about that I'm not seeing happening in our, our corporately funded and distributed film situation right now is that I'm not seeing a lot of films that either pose questions or cause audiences to ask questions. And that's important. That's, that's where education comes in. When people are looking up at the screen and thinking, thinking things, having genuine thought, and I, I think River's Edge does have that quality, and that's, that's what I'm, I'm passionate about in my own filmmaking, and I'm, I'm proud of with, with River's Edge. It seems not to have lost uh, a lot of its impact. It still comes off as radical compared to a lot of the films that are being made uh, today, I think. Mm -hmm.